Chapman, our first scene setter is Pia War. She works in open government and open data issues both at a federal and state level in the Australian government. And I'm told that if you would like to find out more about her, you're welcome to go and look at her Wikipedia entry. So, uh, Pia, would you like to come and uh, get us underway? Okay, hi everyone. Um, hi, so first of all, uh, and I know most of you are going to laugh at my horrendous accent, but kia ora. Um, and thank you very much for having me over here from Australia. <laughs> I do try, I, I can't roll. Anyway, um, but I'm gonna talk about initiatives, uh, a, a lot of initiatives in this speech, and, um, but I just wanted to say I'll blog this speech um, after after I give it, and that way you'll have links for anyone that's interested, so you can just sit back and relax and hopefully keep up with my um, very rapid speech. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Gov 2.0. Um, and for all the techs in here, who in here is technical? A lot of people, so for all the techs, and I am also one, the groan, I agree it is a stupid term, um, but nonetheless it has come to represent something quite profound. E-government of days past was a first step towards governments going online. Um, we looked at how government could be put, you know, could put the same forms and pamphlets that you could access by walking into a, a, a shop, into a government shop front, uh, looking at how we could put them online and how citizens could submit those forms back again to government. So basically taking the way that we always did things and just using the internet to integrate into that. There's a little bit more um, subtlety in some implementations, but e-government you know, very broadly was um, taking what we have always done and just using the internet a little bit better. Um, agencies and departments, by and large, did their own projects, and it certainly did take a huge step towards enabling citizens to access and interact with government. However, the difference between e-government e -government and Gov 2.0 movement is quite significant. So basically, Gov 2.0 is about three core things. Uh, first of all, genuine public engagement. Recognising that governments can work in isolation um, uh, if we are to be relevant to the communities we um, serve, uh, that we can't, sorry, uh, operate in isolation if we're going to best um, be relevant to the communities we serve. And in order to be capable of responding to new opportunities and new challenges in a timely and effective fashion, we need to be collaborative. This also means more access to and transparency around the machinery of government and democracy. Of course, being apolitical, although some of you may not guess it, um, I would love to see this engagement primarily at the public service level, where we have the most incentive to get uh, evidence-based policy outcomes. Public engagement isn't just about getting your media team on social media, it's about recognising that the old premise that the media is the only platform to communicate with the public is now very much false. Traditional media comms are largely about controlling the message, engaging with journalists in the most effective way for them, uh, for broadcasting the message uh, as much as possible in a positive way as possible. Online engagement development skills um, are more about recognising we actually have no control over the message. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's more about herding cats than it is um, leading them by a carrot. Um, it is, uh, it is largely about collaboration, understanding the topic area, understanding where and how the community discussions are taking place. It's about empathy, respect, and a genuine passion for community feedback and input. Citizen-centric service and information de uh, design is the second major pillar of Gov 2.0. So a cross-agency and even cross-jurisdictional approach that doesn't expect an individual to understand the complexities of government, but rather can get a personalised service based on how much or little personal information they want to give. In this way, the bureaucracy of government is um, how it's carved up today and may not be tomorrow is irrelevant to the user. They just want to know, you know, what health services are available to me. They don't care what department delivers them. They don't care what level of government delivers them. Uh, they don't care what party's in control. They just want to know how to get the immunisation information about their kid. So it's about looking at it from their perspective and trying to design how we do things. Now, of course, you can imagine the amount of work that goes into that. You have to have a consolidation of data. You have to have a, a you know, I'll, I'll come to that. But the third major area is government as a platform for public and private innovation. This is where all the open data stuff comes in. By recognising that governments can't and indeed shouldn't try to be everything all the time and that our primary role is to serve the needs of citizens, governments should recognise where we can facilitate others to innovate. 
where we can facilitate them to, um, to create new social and economic value. A great example of this is how is the enormous amount of publicly funded data and software that's made by government through our normal business as usual, and how um, free access to this can actually stimulate entire um, industries and, um, and, economy, uh, and the economy, and also the research sector. Uh, the economic value, for instance, of a number of geospatial dats, um, data sets in the US, there was, this was a study a few years back, demonstrated that the broader net economic benefit was something like 20 times what the government could ever possibly hope to commercialise. So getting it out there has a, a broader net um, benefit to the, to the nation. So let me give you a brief example of each from Australia, then I'll give you a bit of, uh, a bit of understanding of what's happening around the world and then throw a few um, grenades into the discussion. So um, from Australian perspective, the genuine public engagement um, sort of pillar um, I was actually involved in running a thing called Public Sphere, which, which, uh, which was a um, public policy consultation methodology that basically uh, took traditional government consultation and um, added online to the, to the mix. So, and we found that we got a few really good benefits from that. First of all, by having a public, transparent and online component to a government po uh, policy consultation meant that people could actually peer review other stuff that was coming into the mix. That's really important because it, um, it means that you know, the most pretty um, paper contributed by a very well-paid um, organisation, uh, someone else with expertise in that area can actually give you um, peer review. It may look pretty and sound pretty, but actually it's not based on a good um, evidence or premise. Uh, it also helps get more people involved because they can see what other people are contributing to the discussion and want to put their own two cents in. It lowers the barrier to entry rather than having to write up, you know, spend several weeks or days writing up a paper and contributing it to a opaque process that you don't know where it goes. You can contribute it to an open process. You can contribute it in whatever way most suits you. You might just want to contribute a tweet to say actually that's a stupid idea or you might want to write a paper or contribute a video or whatever is most suitable for you. It's about identifying and engaging with the community and the conversations wherever they are rather than expecting to build the mountain and have everyone come to you. Second example, um, citizen-centric and information, uh, service and information design. Uh, so Australia.gov.au is currently a project in beta. It's a very, very early phase. Uh, but the idea is to come to that single interface for citizens. At this point, just from a federal perspective, though. And um, so people can have a consistent login for, you know, for, their, um, for the welfare services or child protection services or health services or whatever your interaction with government is, being able to go to the one place, um, engage with it as much or little as you want, uh, have a single login for all of those different services and be able to say, actually, I choose or choose not to share my private information across government um, and, and have that personal control over your private information. So it's in development, but it's a, it's a very ambitious and visionary project. And um, we actually have one of your own over helping us, uh, a person who used to work in the New Zealand government uh, working on, um, uh, uh, I guess, citizen-centric service delivery around um, tax over here. So um, it's really good to be able to tap into some of the skills. The third area is government as a platform. So we, uh, uh, the, uh, the project I'm currently working on for one of the state governments in Australia is looking at a consolidated open data approach, trying to actually get every department and agency within a government to release their data in a consolidated format, in an open standard, with a permissive copyright, with all of these things, is very hard. Um, and you end up finding yourself um, held ransom to um, procurement cycles, to who the politics of the day um, are, to um, legacy systems, and, and it's really quite challenging. So they're taking a new approach, which I think is quite uh, revolutionary. They're saying, okay, well, we, we'll create a system that no matter what the data set is, we will write a API for it. So if you've got an Oracle database or a series of Excel spreadsheets or a, you know, Microsoft Access or a um, MSSQL, sorry, MySQL, um, MySQL, whatever your back-end data set, and that's a very loose definition, of course, is, we will write um, the technology we need to interface with that so that we can present all the data in a consistent format that people can then transcode into whatever format is most suitable for their purposes. People will have the um, data visualization and mapping tools so that they can play with the data on our website and, um, and not have to have specialist research or data viz skills to be able to come up with meaningful interactions with government data. Um, and we'll be able to create personalised views for a particular community. So, for instance, wanting to create a view for health, uh, we might say, uh, well, let's say tourism. It's actually a little bit more 
um, encapsulating. So, you know, here are the health services in the area, here are the bus services in the area, here are the national, cultural and other, you know, artefacts in the area. Being able to consolidate that down into a single view based on a particular community's needs. It's very revolutionary. It's going to be launched in the next um, four to six weeks and uh, there is actually information about it which um, in an early media release that I'll, uh, I'll put on the blog, but it's called Data ACT. The, uh, and another part of that is, but how does that actually stimulate innovation? So GovHack was a project that uh, I actually um, was on the team running a month ago, where we took data sets from seven different government departments and agencies across federal and state, and um, put in place a little bit of you know, financial incentive, and had 150 or 60 um, developers uh, in a 48 hour period come up with 42 working software um, prototypes um, around a whole, around three core areas, around science, digital humanities and open government. That was fantastic. For the first time ever, our federal government budget, which for the last several years have, has actually been released under Creative Commons, which is a great start, but it's released in very dense papers. There's no spreadsheets. There's, I, I understand that your treasury actually releases Excel spreadsheets. That's a great start. Um, ours doesn't even do that. So they actually had to screen scrape those documents and get all the treasury data put it into a visualization tool that you could interface with and interact with and drill down to specific projects and see, well, it turns out we're spending $18 per taxpayer in Australia on a whole bunch of submarines that no one uses. Good to know. Um, so there's some really good projects where um, w when you actually release government data and indeed software uh, that people can build on top of, and this is the same in the research sector as well, then you create opportunity for people to do great stuff. So. Um, I guess the, the big question is, uh, so basically Gov 2.0 to e-government is effectively what social media is to email. It's a whole new world of collaboration, consolidation and crowdsourcing. So what does it take to achieve open government or Gov 2.0? First of all, great people. Uh, you need to either identify, upskill or hire awesome people. And it sounds, sounds you know, pithy, but at the end of the day, great people are what drive great innovation. So if you don't enable great people in your organisations and identify and reward and um, give them permission to do great stuff, then, you know, it, it, it's not going to happen, basically. Uh, I did a great interview with um, Vivek Kundra, who used to be the CIO, CTO of the US government, and that was the key point he made uh, from the experience he had in, um, in the US government. Political leadership is really handy and really useful. Uh, there's been declarations of open government made in lots of different countries, including Australia, New Zealand, US, UK. But the really big one from a political leadership perspective, and I would put this to our, our political um, panellists today, is that the public service in particular needs permission to make mistakes. Um, if you say, we're doing this stuff, we want to do open government, we want to be more transparent, um, and we're going to make mistakes and that's okay, because this is a whole new world, then your entire public service can actually move and, and do great stuff. Otherwise, they're going to be bound by um, being worried about making mistakes. Third. Policy, um, directives and support for all of government to comply, to engage online, uh, risk mitigation strategies. You need to have a, a decent policy framework and there's some really good policy work happening in Australia that I'm certainly happy to share with anyone that's interested in that space. Technical, uh, procurement policy. Weirdly enough, you can have all the vision that you like, but when it comes to what government actually buys and how it implements that technology, everything we do is based on the technology we use. Our very freedom is defined by the technologies that we use. So um, you need to make sure that your technical policies, which ends up being your procurement policies, standards policies, copyright, interoperability APIs, um, you know, it's really important to get those things right. Uh, and geospatial as well. If you don't collect and share as much geospatial information as possible, it's going to be impossible to create a citizen-centric view of and, um, and service for uh, around government. Cultural, you need to shift to a collaborative, open, engaging and um, uh, sort of culture within the public service. And this is already happening in Australia and happening around the world, but it is a little bit slow. Um, Genuine interest in what the public can bring is a big part of that culture shift. Uh, a lot of people in government um, need, you know, they, they feel the need to do public consultation for transparency's sake, but there's not necessarily a perspective that they're going to get anything valuable out of it. When you start to recognise that actually you can get great stuff out of crowdsourcing, then um, then 
because you're coming from that premise, you will naturally make the right decisions that enable people to make great contributions. It's a little bit chicken and egg, but it's certainly been my experience. I've, I remember being in a console, a meeting with someone in Australia who will remain unnamed, very, very senior. They were looking at doing a big public consultation and, um, and this person said, um, they, it just felt wrong. It felt wrong by about two degrees and I didn't know why. So I pushed and niggled as I am wont to do. And eventually this person said, well, people should feel happy we're allowing them to have a, a say at all. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm really glad you said that. I really put her off by actually laughing. Um, but um, I said, I'm really glad you said that because if you have that attitude, you're going to make mistakes and people will smell the bullshit. And if they do, then you will have a terrible consultation and you can't blame it being online, you can't blame the technology, you can only blame yourself. She went in with the attitude, they did a terrible consultation. Anyway, um, and finally, well, two last ones, structural, you need to be able to have the mechanism to have compliance across government and, and buy-in across government, but I'll get to that. But finally, precedent, and this is a big one. Wherever you see great examples, you need to celebrate them, you need to document, you need to share. Um, if you actually have a community that's sharing all this stuff, then within your organisation, when someone says, hey, we'd like to do this cool thing, um, and, um, and your boss says, oh, no, 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 that, that's too risky, can't possibly do it, and you say, well, actually, they've already done it, and so have they, and here's the risk mitigation strategy they had. Um, half the time you'll be able to get, uh, you'll be able to bypass. Um, no one wants to be seen to be first, and so using each other in that way is, is kind of handy, um, and just being able to point out precedents. So let's look just briefly at what's happening around the world in this space, uh, just very briefly. So in the US, uh, UK, um, several years before the Australian Gov 2.0 task force was the Power for Information task force, uh, and that's kind of been what's kicked off a lot of what happened in the UK around open data. They've also got a report about um, improving the front line, but I'll post those links to my blog. Some really, really important documents. Uh, in Australia, by the way, the policy status around this stuff is largely bound in the Gov2.0 task force report, number one, and the head of the game report, number two. Those are kind of the policy settings where everything is derived from. But there's a lot of other stuff, and I'll post to that as well. In, um, but there's been fantastic projects throughout the UK, both around open data, around engaging with the developer community, and trying to shift the um, frontline service delivery as well in the US. A lot of people talk about open data in the US, and it's fascinating for me because they've traditionally had an open data by default status. Now then what's happened over the years is they've changed the security um, uh, classifications so that less and less data went into the general public, which, is, which was very interesting to watch. But, um, but they have you know, a, a cultural expectation of openness because there's such a lack of trust with government. Whereas both New Zealand, Australia, the UK and Canada come from that crown copyright assumption because of our you know, cultural um, you know, assumptions. Um, but, um, but they do have had some fantastic initiatives. One of my favourites was the IT dashboard, where they took the um, uh, IT department budgets and did a, com you know, a way to be able to contrast and compare those um, through an interactive tool. Uh, they've got the Open Government Partnership, which they're leading, I believe, which I'm not exactly sure what it does, but Australia's not a member yet, and I'm, I hope we become one, but, um, but that's been interesting to watch. But for me, also, for the, um, the fact that, um, in particular Vivek Kundra, but they've started to hold industry account to actually deliver on what government are trying to achieve, uh, so that's interesting. Canada, one of my favourite examples of restructuring of government for innovation is um, the office of the CIO there. Uh, the new CIO came in and said, well... Um, CIO, CTO, I think, I think he's the CIO, came in and said, want to do things differently, what do you guys reckon? Did this big internal consult, um, consultation. And one of the outcomes was that they got rid of entirely the hierarchy of how it worked. So it took out the, you know, the seven layers of managers and all that kind of stuff and ended up having a completely flat structure. So everyone was working on projects on a skills and time basis. So the team manager you report to today could be working for you tomorrow. It completely shifted the, the traditional power structure and hierarchy of government. And he ended up with a lot more efficient teams and um, people empowered to do stuff and people who felt that they would get recognised for their good work. Um, and of course a few people freaked out and left and that's cool. Uh, he got new people who were excited to be innovative, so that's just an interesting example. Of course, with New Zealand, Vikram will, get, um, we will be going into that, but um, the last thing I want to just briefly go through is that this is all part of a bigger picture, and if you don't know that bigger picture, then you're going to miss out on what the context is. But um, Gov2 is riding on the back of a significant and incredible movement that's sweeping across the planet. Um, which is no, you know, no less evident than the conversations here at NetHui. Um, but um, we, it's the power of collaboration that we actually find true innovation. And technology has effectively shifted the way we think. 
Uh, I know this is a big statement, but within a decade or two, we've seen widespread and rapidly growing access to um, all the traditional dimensions of power that are, are the very foundations of society that, um, that, you know, w w that the assumptions we're coming from. Um, think about it, we now have massive distribution of publishing, of communications, of monitoring, and anyone who else who's read Foucault knows that he would love the internet. Um, it switches it all on its head and turns it around. Uh, force, and of course this is the one that's keeping spooks up at night. Um, and finally, the emerging possibility of massive distribution of property with 3D printing and nanotechnology. So all of the basic premises of, of power and, and structure and hierarchy in our societies are, are, are crumbling, which is fascinating. So power used to be who had the biggest swords of guns, but technology gives us all the power to be disruptive, and it's terrifying and liberating. So with these major shifts in society, it brings up the interesting question of what's the point of government? For some, it's about creating and enforcing laws. For some, it's about market regulation. Perhaps government is about the common good. You know, there's a lot of questions there. For me, government's a way to get an economy of scale for common good and common problems in a society. And it goes a long way towards a good baseline um, quality of life for people, for all people in a society, no matter what situation they were born into. I know this comes from you know, an Australian perspective, but I think we largely share that cultural assumption in New Zealand. Um, but you know, even regulation, trade, health, roads, ed education, all of this comes from the basic premise that government can play a role in creating a quality of life, I think, for, for citizens, so that we can all thrive socially, economically, and democratically. The point is that this life has changed dramatically, and being clear on what assumptions from the past still hold, and what don't still hold for the future, is an important part of creating some resilience for how we move, how we move forward. Um, sorry, I had to use that term at some point. Basically, the future of government and indeed society is to be found in collaboration, in leveraging the skills, passion, and experience um, found throughout our society, our entire societies, and transparently building the future together. So, uh, thank you very much, and I'll leave you to it. <laughs>